Friends, colleagues and listeners, here we are. We've got another podcast show and I've got a great guest today. And I say great because uh, I've met I've met the gentleman a few times and um, I really like I really like what he's doing, where he's come from, why he is where he is. And we're going to find out all those key issues as we move on. The person I'm speaking about is um, Hassan El- El-Houri and he's the chairman of Men's Aviation. And Hassan, lovely to have you on board. Thank you for giving us some of your uh, very valuable time. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for the kind words. No, it's honestly, it's an absolute pleasure. Now, sir, without people listening to me, I'd like to ask you just one quick, one quick favour, if I may, if you could just give a quick background as to how you came to be where you are. Sure. So in 2007, um, I joined a company called Agility Logistics, which is a Kuwaiti logistics and freight forwarding holding company. And it happened to own a very small aviation services company called National Aviation Services. And in late 2007, early 2008, the uh, chairman at the time asked me to run NAS. My initial reaction was, no way, I'm the wrong guy and it doesn't really align with my career aspirations. Well, he twisted my arm and um, I didn't really have much of a choice. So a few months later, I became the CEO of little known NAS, which operated at that time in Kuwait and yeah. Aqaba, Jordan. That was it. And, you know, within the span of about 12 years, we became the largest aviation services company in the Middle East and Africa. We were operating in 55 airports and I think, a, you know, two dozen countries or so. And we were really building a brand that, we were very proud of and airlines started to recognize and countries, particularly in the Middle East and Africa and South Asia started to recognize and respect. But, you know, as you, as you alluded earlier, you know, I I had global uh, aspirations and on two occasions, uh, um, I, I presented to my board the idea of acquiring Menzies Aviation. So I was watching Menzies Aviation from about 2017 and every time the stock price dipped, I would um, approach my board and say, look, you know, we can get a global company with a very well-respected brand and a rich heritage and a great team for, you know, a certain discount. And both times my proposal was not accepted. But in 2021, just coming out of COVID, I made the plea for a third time and the board said, you know what, maybe there's some merit to this. And we explored and it seemed like a good, a good, you know, financial investment. And um, here we are, we we ended up acquiring Menzies, merging it with NAS, and thereby building, you know, the largest aviation services company in the world. And one that I think airlines respect and hold in very high regard because of our focus on quality and safety and security. Um, but also because we have an amazing management team and uh, amazing people throughout the company. We have 45,000 people in about 280 airports and every one of them upholds our people, passion, pride uh, tagline every day and everything they do. Yeah. Which is, um, which is a good, a good tagline by the way. Um, but also I, I've always followed Menzies because of, of having my Lufthansa background. And then when London decided to outsource it's, self-handling and it went to LCC and then LCC to Menzies. Um, I had huge amounts of uh, interaction there. So it's a great brand, as you said, and it's got a great legacy. And um, I think it was a very, very, very good idea on your behalf to go for them. Thank you very much. Now, sir, now that you're there and you're leading, you're leading what you did before, and now you've got the, um, you've got the uh, Menzies stable with you, Okay, what what then made you now want to sort of be more representative of the industry? And, and I'm talking now about your involvement with ASA. So ASA, you know, as you correctly said, is the representative body or should be the representative body for Good aviation point. services companies around the world. We need a voice, an independent voice of us. The airlines have the IATA, the airports have ACI. We need to have a collective voice. 
And so that's where ASA comes in. There are other organizations around the world, by the way. ASA is not by any measure the only organization. Yep. But for various reasons, it is the organization that we've chosen to back and you know to to support. And that's the one that we're we're gonna be supporting for the for the short run at least. Uh, last year, we restructured and reorganized ASA. As you probably know, we created the supervisory board. Yeah, We created the supervisory board to make ASA more agile because it is really not efficient to have to go to 200 members every time you want to take one step forward. Yep. And so we created the supervisory board, which contrary to common belief, represents the large ground handling companies, but also has representation from the smaller ground handling companies. So there is representation from both sides on the supervisory board, okay? And yeah. we want ASA to have a stronger voice. We want ASA to have a stronger saying, particularly around things like labor uh, and, 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 and labor rights, um, minimum standards, quality. Um, these I think are the two fundamental things that need to be addressed in the industry. There are others, but I think these are the two that are probably the most pressing. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And now you said there about should represent, and um, you also mentioned about, you know, democracy is a very hard thing to to satisfy. And and when everybody needs to say yay or nay, and, and you don't have that, you know, full support, sometimes you have to take decisions and just push forward. And I think that's one of the problems that, and you mentioned IATA and ACI, et cetera. But I think that's one of the issues that most of the most of the representative bodies have as a big barrier or a, a, a mist in front of their eyes. You're never going to be able to please everybody all of the time. And sometimes some of these issues need to be pushed and really leveraged. Correct. I agree. Now, what I'd like to ask you, if you don't mind, and, and we've, you know, we've got a few topics, but we don't have to stay strictly within the boundaries, but... Who or how can we as an industry start to change many of the legacy issues that seem to be stuck without the required change or transition? So when the outsiders or when you go to conferences, you know, a lot of people now, oh, God, here we go. Same old thing, same old discussion, same old challenges, same old reasons. When are people going to actually see a body or a few people actually say, we are now going to do this because? Okay. The first thing I think is, we need to change the mindset from baggage handlers yep. to aviation services providers. It is remarkable, Chris, the number of industry experts that I speak to that still refer to us as baggage handlers. Yeah, box movers. And baggage handling is a fraction of what we really do. With all due respect to baggage handling, it is a part of what we do and we do it with pride, but it is not the only thing that we do. We do check-in, we do loading, offloading cargo, we do cleaning, water, lav, weight and balance, you know, fueling. We're the largest independent aviation fueling company in the world. All of these are part of aviation services, you know, and our peers, our big peers, they also have a full suite of services that they offer as well. Yeah. Yeah. And baggage handling is only a fraction and, and ironically is the least technical part of what we do, right? So I think we need to change the mindset from baggage handling to aviation services. And aviation services is, you know, has a safety element, a security element, a quality element, an on-time performance element. There are so many different things that go into the different aviation services that we, we provide. So that's number one. Number two is partnerships. Yeah. We, we cannot work in isolation as, as aviation services companies. The airlines cannot work in isolation. The airports cannot work in isolation. Freight forwarders and, 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 and cargo agents cannot work in isolation. We have to work together. So when you ask me, what do we need to change? That's it. We need to, we need to see one another as partners in, in this industry and making this industry a success. Yeah. We cannot work in isolation. And the final thing I would say is, we need to have minimum standards that we all sign up to around the world. You know, the, the most profound evidence of globalization is how airlines speak to one another and speak to 
ground control as they navigate through different countries. Yep. Think, you know, think of a flight going from, for argument's sake, from Dubai to New York. How many different countries, airspaces do they fly over? Yeah. And yet you as a passenger, you feel none of that. The yep. flight is smooth. But in the cockpit, the pilot is frantically speaking with different, you know, different towers and, you know, all kinds of paperwork is done. Payments are made. All kinds of safety requirements are, are, are complied with. But you don't know any of that. Yeah. Because there are global minimum standards that every airline signs up to. Same yep. thing needs to happen with, with, with aviation services. We need to have global standards. So if you are, you know, Lufthansa and you're flying to airport A or you're flying to airport B, you know that there's a certain minimum level of standard that both airports are complying with and your aircraft is safe at both airports and your passengers will be treated in a certain way at both airports. Yeah, no, I I, to I totally agree with that, Sam. And now the, the the question I've got then is, you know, if you're looking at minimum expectations and you're looking at, you know, global standards, it must be so frustrating. I It was for me when I was looking after some handling companies when one carrier would say, yep, yeah, okay, we're happy with IGOM or ICHM, but we want this extra. And then local management would say, and I want this, and I want that. And then you've got to explain to the staff that for one carrier, you do it with your hand on your head. Another one, you've got to put your finger in your ear. Another one, you've got to hold your nose. It's very difficult then to get consistency, especially around certain critical SOPs. So why why does the handling community, or as you said now, you know the the um, the um, services, the, the aviation services providers, why don't you say no more often? Well, Chris, at the end of the day, we are we are private companies. In other words, we are businesses that yeah. need to operate and we we compete with one another. And so we have to please the customer. Yeah. That's not to say that we're charities. We're not charities. So we don't do any of the additional services that you referenced for free. Everything comes at a price. But you know, we have to we have to please our customer and we compete with one another and we we compete for customer satisfaction, which is the right thing, by the way. That yeah. Yeah. You know, that you want that to happen. You want competition. Competition is good. You want us to be competing with one another to improve our services, to become more efficient, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it comes at a price, of course. No problem. No problem with the price issue. I think that's right. Because if there is these global minimum standards that we're talking about, Hassan, and once people accept that that's what it is, then you compete above that because that has to be the common denominator of everything that that happens so what i you know you mentioned there about a mindset and a mind shift um you know even externally people looking in at our industry they haven't got a good enough understanding and there's an awful lot of ignorance still around it not only from within but also from outside so with with what you're doing and what you're trying to achieve how do you think you're going to be able to change those you know those mindsets or mind shifts and and through ASA, do you think you're going to be able to make them as quickly as you'd like to? Look, we, with ASA, we want to do it through partnerships and education. So I think we need to we need to work closer with ACI, and we need yep. to work closer with with the IATA. Um, I think part of the part of the the um, part of the onus fall or responsibility falls on us. We as ASA were not in the past. 100% aligned internally. We were distracted with yeah. other things. With, we were distracted with other things. And, you know, for various reasons, which, you know, I probably don't want to get into, I don't think we 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 made the right outreach to ACI or IATA. Correct. However, looking to the future and in the very short term, what I would like is that we do reach out to ACI and we do reach out to IATA and we offer them real value in a partnership with us because they they're busy with their own things they wouldn't you know spend time and money and effort in building a partnership with asa if we don't have our own house in order yeah so and and we don't show value so we have to show value and if we do that um i think i think there's no reason why aci and iata wouldn't engage with us to achieve the objectives that we all have which is yep. safety, security, and passenger experience. So that's on, on one side. The other side is education. 
as I said earlier, there, it's remarkable the number of people who are, you know, industry veterans who don't know what we do. And so we have to educate them, whether they're regulators, whether they're airlines, whether they're procurement people in airlines, you know, whether they are uh, uh, COOs of airlines or of airports, they need to know what it is that we do. They, they need to be, be made aware. And again, the responsibility part of it falls on us to make sure that we communicate all the complex things that we do on a daily basis. And that's, so through partnerships and education, that's how I hope we can achieve our, our, our joint vision. Okay, very good. Now, following on from that, and you mentioned earlier about, about the partnerships and, and you mentioned the various stages in the, in the supply chain or in the partnership chain. Do you think realistically that all of the verticals will be able to move together or do you think there's some, there's some mileage in looking for like-minded partners and then creating a POC on how it can work um, with everybody focusing on, you know, making things more efficient, realizing that if you're in a relay team, the way you hand over the baton is so important for the person taking it. And then again and again, and do you think that if there was a POC whereby, you know, you could say, right, these three or four airports, these three or four, you know, um, aviation service providers, these three or four global forwarders, et cetera, et cetera, if they all lumped onto a, you know, a common, a common plan, and then they could prove that it could be done. Do you think that's an opportunity to, to make people do things differently and also take advantage of, of IT, digitization, technology, making commitments that people talk about time and time again. Do you think that's a way also that associations could drive that POC principle? I'm a big believer in, in incremental change. You, yeah. you, you an, an organization cannot develop if you have one person take a thousand steps forward. You yeah. need a thousand people to take one step forward and then another step, and then another step. So, it, it, you know, to, to use your example, I would like to see a POC in several airports or countries or regions show that it is successful, show the impact it's had on passenger experience, on airline experience, you know, on, on airport safety and security and congestion and so on, and then try to expand that and use that as an example for others. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think I think that's definitely the way to go. And what you said there about inspirational, I don't know how many people out there or whether you, you've heard it yourself, but there was a film called Any Given Sunday, and Al Pacino gives a speech about inch by inch all moving together. It's probably yeah. one of the most inspirational inspirational speeches I've ever heard, whether it be in real life. It's very inspirational. I'll, I'll need to look it up. Oh, I tell you, you, and if you do it, do it in a darkened room just with your earphones on and just listen to it. It is fantastic. All right, I will. Thank Absolutely you. Absolutely fantastic. So we've got the POC out of the way. Now, one of the things that would go hand in glove with that concept and would make people sit up and listen is then why would people want to come into the industry? Why are the, why are the future experts and the future leaders sitting out there not thinking, I want to get into aviation? So if that was done, and then you could also add a stream in that POC, which was how to attract and retain really good people and also look at people from different levels because it's not always about it's not always about you know what degree somebody's got or whatever i think there's also room now to to open up an aviation and an, an aviation like apprenticeship or an aviation passport and i know i are talking about it but the one i'm i'm thinking about is all based on practical performance competencies not tick box attendance of online certification or whether you've got the good memory for being in certain classroom based uh, training but actual practical performance criteria and i think if people were given that opportunity and when you think about it as and like you, you alluded to earlier, wherever an airport lands or takes off you've got circles that go around it whether it's fueling de-icing catering whether it's general management, finance, whether it's safety officers, whether it's security, whether it's quality based, you've got all these different skills that if you get to do them well, you're mobile, you can go anywhere in the world and do the same thing. And it's a wonderful opportunity for anybody who wants to get into a business that truly is. Global. My advice to young people is between the ages of, let's say, 20 and 35, give or take, that's, yep. when, you're building your, that's when you're building your skill set. Yeah. That's where you're building your resume. And when you're working in aviation, you have to adhere to very strict rules and regulations. 
right? So that is honing that is honing, honing your skill set. You also can't do anything by yourself. You can't turn around an aircraft by yourself. Yep. You have to work with a team. Sometimes you get to choose your team, but most of the time you're working with the people that are allocated to that flight, whether you like them or not. Yep. So you have to work, find a way to deal with them. So you're honing your teamwork skills. You're working under time pressure. You are working in the most challenging environments, extreme cold, snow, extreme heat in the summer. You're yep. working over Thanksgiving, over Christmas, when all your friends and family are having Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving dinner, you're at the airport. When your 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 family's opening Christmas presents, you're at the airport. So it shows dedication and loyalty and commitment to your your work. And finally, as you said, Chris, it is a very mobile skill. You know, you're working in Dallas, working in Heathrow, working in Egypt, Cairo, yep. or you're working in Bangalore, India. Very similar. So. I think aviation is a or aviation services is a great place for you to build your skill set and your resume and your personal work ethic. And that is why I would advise young people to start their careers in aviation. And for the reasons that we said, you know, once you hit 35 and, and your life goals change, that base is a very solid foundation for a career in almost anything, whether you want to move into hospitality, whether you want to move into construction yeah. you want to move into anything else or you want to stay in aviation the basis the foundation is there and it's strong and your work ethic and you can demonstrate that is solid yeah no i, I totally agree with you and and i think i'm i'm case in point because i was never the brightest bulb in the chandelier but through this business i've managed to live in many many countries and have a wonderful life as a result of it and one that, you know, given any opportunity, I would always recommend to youngsters, get into this business. It's fantastic. Exactly. Absolutely brilliant. Yes, I agree. Now, now, on that and moving forward, so now, now we've got the we've got we've got we've got a POC, we've got the youngsters now coming back into the industry, we've got different levels of opportunity, which I think is great. And especially if we did a, an apprenticeship, and these are all things that I think ASA should be interested in. There's another one that I think Asher should do. I I did a load of audits in a particular part of the world, and in three of the in three of the aviation service providers or GHAs that were there, they probably covered I think nearly between seventy and ninety carriers. And then one one of the questions I always ask: How many audits have you had in the last year or so? And irrespective of I say go and I say go to and everything else that comes with it, people still are absolutely. They're, they're, they're overrun with too many audits and the quality of those audits is not brilliant. What about this as a, as a suggestion, Hassan? Why would ASA now not create their own independent group of the very best auditors in the business and allow them to spend more time at those specific facilities and then share the cost of that amongst all the carriers that are there so that the carriers could see the credibility and the, and the consistency and the, and they could verify the effectiveness of those audits in those in those ground handed ages it would save time it would be very very i think respected and it would also be something that wasn't as it is now whether it's iosa whether it's isago people turn up and they're more interested in the commercial implications of not upsetting people too much so that they are happy to request them to come back again and I think if ASA took that strong stance and their members agreed to do that, I think it would be a great sign for the industry. Yep. I don't, Chris, I don't think ASA is there yet. So ASA is in very early stages. That said, all the ground handling companies that I talk to have audit fatigue. Yep. And rightly so. And rightly so. We are doing hundreds, if not thousands of audits every year. And our, and our quality team should be focused really on safety, security, and quality rather than, you know, endless paperwork repetitively, yeah. you know, and, and, totally and, agree. And, and in many cases, brainlessly, you know, but to go back, our hope when ISEGO came out was that ISEGO would eliminate all of these audits. It would be one audit that everybody succumbs to, and that was it. And, and, and many ground handling companies rushed 
to get as many ISEGO audits as they as they can, as you know, because ISEGO is station specific, and then there's one that's you know uh, the umbrella. Yep. Many ground handling companies, including NAS, we rush to get as many ISEGO audits as we can because it would save costs, save you know, a, a bandwidth, allow us to focus on things that matter. Only to realize that ISEGO was a desktop exercise that did not eliminate any of the audits. There was yep. zero reduction in the number of audits. Zero. Yep. So I think the infrastructure is there. The infrastructure, you know, kind of built by the IATA, by the airlines themselves, is there. So let's just use that. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Just use ISEGO. If we need to beef it up, we can beef it up and add some more, you know, parameters and, and metrics and things. That's fine. But let's use that as the basis to reduce the number of audits because the number of audits is huge and it is creating serious audit fatigue by everybody. Yeah, and also a little bit of conflict and confusion as well because the quality of the audits. So again, just for, just for your just for your information, those those um, facilities that I was I was working with, um, they had less findings than they did audits. Yeah, I believe it. So, so then that questions, goodness me, you know what what what's wrong with some of the ones that turn up and could find absolutely nothing? I mean, if you want to look, at, and again, I think the mind shift which we were talking about earlier, you know, people who run facilities should welcome should welcome anybody who turns up and does a review or an audit because it's free cons consultancy, especially if they find opportunities to improve. So nobody should be defensive and think, oh, this is terrible or why are they finding it? It's, it's an opportunity to improve. And as you said, when we're focusing primarily on safety as the as the solid foundation of this industry, that, that should be welcomed. Absolutely. And, you know, to that point, I like working with low-cost carriers, for example, because they challenge your efficiency. And year over year, we become more efficient working with low cost carriers because they genuinely challenge the status quo. Yep. And I like that and I welcome that. But if it is paperwork for paperwork's sake, I think we can do away with that. Yeah, no, 100%, 100%. Now, Move, moving on again now. So, right, we've we've spoken about what could or should or or shall or will happen, but now if it was if it was down to you, and like I said, your your profile coming into the business, and as you said, you know, not people weren't aware of of what NASA had done and, and where they were and how many countries they represented. But once the association with Menzies came about, it moved everything up. And you, as an individual, what do you think are the three most important things? that representative bodies along with the key players who are leading. So it's a little bit like the premiership or, you know, top, top, top sports leagues. The ones that are at the top drive the standards and everybody wants to compete and keep with them. And if the standards are getting higher and higher up there, it's bringing the standards higher of the whole league. So what three things do you think are the most critical things that you'd like to see everybody focusing on now moving forward? So at a, at a macro level, there are, two things that I would like to see everybody focus yeah. on. The first is the people that work in this industry, that work around the clock, weekends, holidays, summer, winter, snow. I would like to see them have a better career path, better development, yeah. better mobility, a better engagement with the companies they work with closer affiliation to the airlines they serve, the passengers they serve, um, increase wages where possible. That's what I would like to see is a genuine focus on the men and women that work tirelessly to keep this global artery alive. Yeah. So that's number one. The second one is minimum standards. Yeah. As we said earlier, there needs to be minimum standards that dictate how this industry will regulate and operate. Yeah. People's lives depend on the safety and security that we provide. And we, we don't take that lightly and nobody should. So minimum standards need to be somehow formulated and imposed on the industry and, and audited and regulated and ensured you know, that they are complied with. So that's at a macro level. At the micro level, Chris, unfortunately, over the past two years, 
I've been speaking with so many people, friends, family, customers, whatever. Passenger experience has deteriorated significantly. Oh, my goodness, yeah. You know, I, I travel, you travel, we all travel. You know, lost bags, yeah. long, long queues at check-in, disorganized boarding gates, um, you know, de delayed flights. You know, you land, you wait 10, 15, 20 minutes for the bridge or for the steps. Yeah. Why? Why? The number of people that I know that are choosing not to travel by air over the summer or Christmas break or Thanksgiving or Easter is astounding. And if we continue like this as an industry, the wake up call we're going to get in a few years is not going to be one that we like. Yep. Because people are just going to turn away and say, I'm not going to go to, you know, for argument's sake, you know, uh, take mayor, you know, I'm not going to go to Mallorca for the, for, you know, for a week and spend two days waiting for my luggage because yeah. I didn't make it onto my flight, you know? And so yeah. we really need to address the passenger experience as an industry. Yeah. Airlines, airports, and aviation services providers, all three of us together. Yeah, 100% agree. And I, I don't know if, if you've spent time or noticed it, like I said, I, I've been traveling now for the last six, seven weeks, and I've been all over the world. And um, the the thing that I'm spending little time now and focus on is how do people communicate when things are going wrong? And even that level, the level of communication is not what it used to be. You know, it, it's almost like it's okay to have a reason or an excuse instead of instead of making people feel that the situation has now been recovered and that you know somebody's taken charge of it. And the, and the communication storyline is missing. So whether you're waiting for your bags, as you said, or whether you're in a queue outside of a, of a cargo terminal, or whether you've only got a small package and you want to deliver it quickly and all the doors are closed, and then the response you get from the staff, I really, really think that this customer experience now is something that needs to be brought in across the board. So people themselves, they realize that, that they're also a customer most of the time, and why would their expectations change when they're actually working on the customer experience side of things? That's what I don't understand, yeah. you know. And it's everything. It's from do, you know, do people care? You know, do they smile? Do they do they respect logic? Is there some common sense there? Those yeah. are the things that seem to be you know that dripping. I don't know where they're dripping or where they're they're eroding, but that seems to be going. And it's such a shame. And that's across industries. That's not just ours. You go to the restaurants, you go into shops, you go, you know, you do all these different different things with with um, even even mechanics getting your car serviced and somebody forgets to do something. They almost say, well, you know, sorry, but we forgot to do it. It's human error. We'll do it again. But that's not the right way to look at it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, focusing on our industry. Yes, we, we have a serious issue and it's only getting worse. We need to address it. Yep, no, 100%. Right, Hassan, we're nearly at the end of, of this podcast and there's so many other things I'd love to talk to you about because because of the way you the way you respond and the way you answer and I know how committed and engaged you are. But now just to just to finish, we had the we had the, the three areas that you'd like to that you'd like to see worked on covering macro and micro. Um what do you think now are going to be the biggest just a few examples of what you consider to the to be the biggest disrupting influences that we're all collectively going to have to get over together over this next couple of years. Well, passenger experience is, is, is the first one that I think needs to be addressed. Yeah. The second one is around sustainability. So people globally are more conscious today about, you know, carbon emissions and the impact their actions and their behaviors have on, on planet earth. Yep. So that I think is something that we need to really think about, you know, for us at Menzies, you know, we've committed that by 2033, which is our 200 year anniversary, we will be 100%, uh, you know, carbon neutral. We've made that commitment publicly, we've and we're working very hard in that direction. Brilliant. Uh, but we are a small fraction. Yep. Carbon emissions of the aviation sector globally. So I think the, the, the sector at a more holistic level needs to step up and figure out how we're going to use SAF or we're going to leapfrog SAF and go into something else, hydrogen, for example, or whatever that may be, to address the sustainability perspective. But P2 
people today are far more conscious than they were five years ago or 10 years ago about the impact their behavior has on, 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 on the environment. And as an industry, we need to take that seriously. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree there. And do you think that do you think that from a, a global community that they've got a good enough understanding and awareness of actually what going green is, um, you know, in detail? Because obviously, people look and see an aircraft, they think that's terrible. But you know, for for trade, for business, and and you've got your tag, which is people, passion, and pride. And the one I I always try and make people appreciate is that you know it's people, process, performance, and profit. And if you're not making a profit, you're not going to be able to put enough effort into the planet. Uh, yes. And it's just the way of the world. So, you know, people need to get it all in order and have a, have a better overview. Otherwise, you know, some companies, they might as well just paint all their equipment green, give the staff green uniforms and do everything in green ink. And then people assume that it's uh, that it's green. Look, I think we, we all have to agree on the principle that the private sector fuels the world economy, no pun intended with the world with yeah. the word fuel. It is the private sector that that drives the world forward. I mean, you, you, you know, wherever you look, it is the private sector, whether in healthcare, in education, and in, in aviation, and hospitality, construction, it's the private sector. So yes, as a private company, we need to turn a profit. That's a given. Yeah. But we are also citizens of the world. We're citizens of the communities that we live in. And so we need to be respectful and we need to do the right thing. And the right thing is to be mindful of our carbon emissions and wherever we can to address that. You know, we, the, 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 the first question you ask is, is this the right thing to do? Yeah. And, when, and if you say yes, you then need to find a way to make it happen, balancing your other priorities. The, the environment, earth, uh, sustainability, it's the right thing to do. So we have to we have to work in that direction. Mind you, also tie it back to one of the discussions we had earlier about people. So people today are far more attuned to the impact their companies have on the world. And people want to work for good companies. People don't want to work yep. for dirty, quote unquote, companies. And to the extent that we can give our employees the the good company that they work for and, and they're proud when they go home they're proud in front of their neighbors in front of their family that i, I would yeah. recommend these that helps that helps um and 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 you know that's that's kind of where we want to go with this yeah no i agree and, and coming back again to the cooperation with airports uh you know i think a lot more could be done for for people supporting the community um you know around the airport and the airport instead of all the, the individual elements that make up that community. And if people are proud to work in that sector and for that area, I think it's a great thing. It makes people feel so much better. So, yeah, yeah I, I totally agree with that. And and then it also makes them perform better. And on that performance level, one thing I just want to ask you for, if you don't mind, before we finish, is the most important things in our, in our industry, safety, 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 more safety, and then safety from every other other way. People have to appreciate that and understand it. Now, of late, and because of many, many issues, time pressure, personnel pressure, people leaving the industry, people coming in and not having enough training because of time constraints, et cetera, expectation, organizations having to rebound after some terrible you know, examples and experiences, many, many, many influencing factors. But the level of incidents, and and now I'm talking global, and, I, and I'm sorry to say, you know, the Boeing story and, and and everything else, people are now thinking, oh my goodness me, how can that happen? And I think you'd agree, we need to really, really drill down on this now very, very quickly. I'm going to challenge that for a minute and and say, aviation is still the safest mode of transport. Yeah. Safer than driving a car, safer than any other means of transportation. Yeah. And that is thanks to regulation, thanks to the men and women that work tirelessly to make sure it remains safe. Yeah. And of course, you know, my role, your role, all of what we what we do day in and day out. So let's start with that. All of the symptoms that you describe are all accurate new blood coming in, the inexper the experienced people leaving, turnover, time pressure, yeah. all of that is correct. 
But as an industry, and this is another thing that we need to work on, we don't have proper statistics. Yes. So when when I look at my safety record at Menzies, yep. I do not have a benchmark. I can only benchmark my airports against one another or against historic performance. Yep. I cannot benchmark my airports compared to your airports or compared to someone else's airports. And that adds a level of complexity also for the airports themselves because they cannot say, well, we want the safest company. Well, who's the safest company? We don't know. Yep. We know. We believe we are the safest company. We would like the world to know that. But in the absence of objective, uh, um, thorough data, it's very difficult to make those kind of uh, uh, strides and and regulations. So we need to. We really need to spend time on building the data pool. Yep, hundred percent, hundred percent. And it's that data sharing and the collaboration. And don't 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 get me wrong at all, Hassan. And for everybody from my ARTA who are doing you know as much as they can to get all the safety data, it's a difficult thing because nobody actually wants to divulge it and feel that they're putting themselves at a less competitive. Um, stance or you know or, or they're showing themselves up not to be as good as they should be so it's a difficult thing but as an industry it would be great if we could have better data and yep. and that data sharing would be would be fantastic yep yep sir thank you so much for your time okay. thank you it, thanks for having I really me enjoyed it i've enjoyed listening to you i've enjoyed listening to what you're going to do and like i, I said to you before the show uh, you know i think i think you're you're positioned well with what you've already done and what you want to do, you know, to make make things happen and and make them happen as quickly as possible for so many good people, like you said, who are working twenty four seven in all conditions. Um, and it's it's important. It's important that everybody recognises what's been done. And uh, good on you. Good luck with everything that you're going to do. And Thank I you. hope to see you again very very soon. Me too. Thanks, Chris. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you.